go. Well, good evening and welcome to another lively adventure of reading the Bible in a year. Let's start with prayer and we'll move on from there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth. Who art in all places and fillest all things, treasure blessings, giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages, amen. A holy trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. All right, so welcome. Thank you very much for being here. So uh, what kind of questions do we have? Do we have anything about the readings that we've done or e even the daily readings? We could talk about pretty much anything you want. Questions, comments, concerns. Oh, Norma has to go to the back of the class. Oh, well. That's all right. We can sleep back there. <laughs> well, I'll repeat the question that I asked you because I thought okay. that was an okay. interesting answer. And that is All right, hold on. Why is Go ahead. Why is there so much repetition? It's you know, it made me think like Moses had to like do ten a ten thousand word essay, so he kept repeating himself to be able to meet the minimum number of words. I'm sure that wasn't it. No, but it just there's so much repetition of exactly the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, Why is that? Um, there are a number of reasons. the The one I would give is, and and I know to some they would consider this a little bit out of the um, tradition, but the bottom line is these texts are not written by one person. Um, when you get to Deuteronomy, actually, uh, Moses actually talks about Moses's death. And that's really hard to accomplish. <laughs> so it's, it's a collection of things. And so there are a number of, of aspects that we need to remember about all of this. So the first one, we haven't gotten to Deuteronomy. It'll be very soon that we get to Deuteronomy. And if you think things have been repeated so far, when you get to Deuteronomy, it is a total rehash of everything that has happened because Deuteronomy is understood to be a second book that's been added to the other four. Deutero means other. Nomo means law. So it's another law or another writing. Okay. That is, like I said, that's to come. In the tradition, there are several different veins there is a priestly vein. You can see it all over the place. Whenever someone's building a temple or building an altar, making an offering to God, this is the priestly line, okay? But there are other lines too, where there are certain words that are emphasized or certain themes that are emphasized. Um, a lot of passages you'll see mention of Elohim. Um, I think there are others that mention Adonai. So, um, these are Hebrew words. Elohim is a word for God, but it kind of means God of the mountains. Elohim. Yeah, it's Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. Not on the test. So, um, and another is Adonai, which means the Lord. Um, there was a movement in the 70s, really, 60s and 70s, to um, actually have Christians say Yahweh instead of Adonai, because Yahweh is actually the name that Moses is given when he has that little dialogue with God. And he says, now who shall I say is sending me? And God says, Yahweh. But Yahweh literally means I am the one who is. It is a circulation. It, it's, it's not meant to make sense. I am the one who exists. I am the one who is. Okay. Um, 
way we would interpret that is I am the one who truly exists because God is the only one who truly exists. We come and we go, right? We we didn't exist in the 1500s. We won't exist in the 2500s, okay? But we exist now, right? So God is the only one that is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, okay? He never changes and he will never not be. So he is the only one who truly exists, all right? So Yahweh literally means that. And so this particular translation of the Bible called the Jerusalem Bible, if you get one of those from the late 60s, it's actually an excellent book. It's probably one of the best English translations out there, but they've messed it up a lot in recent days because of other concerns. But it was an excellent translation. It was the one of the Orthodox um, people like Tom Hopko and and, uh, and Alexander Schmemann, they would be the ones that were recommended for the students to read when they were in seminary. RSV was always there too, the Revised Standard Version, which is the one that we generally use um, today. Um, even the Bibles that we use, by the way, um, the, not so sure about the, well, I can tell you right now, the epistle is not um, from the RSV, but the gospel is with the several modifications that were made by one of our former bishops, Bishop Dimitri Corey. All right, so um, getting back to the question, though, the repetition. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that, again, we are dealing with verbal transmission of information from person to person to person. If you hang around me long enough, you hear the same stories about 20 times a year. OK, it's just because there are certain things that I know and, and can refer to. Um, sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes you can just roll your eyes, shut me out and go do something else. But there is that idea of repetition in the sense that oral tradition repeats to remember and to remind. OK, so we have that element to it also. Um, and I think the most important thing is to just bear in mind that it's not meant to be the same kind of linear transmission that that most of the stories that we read today have i mean of course something as magisterial as the the um the odyssey or, or the iliad those books of greek mythology and greek story their narratives but they're written in poetry okay so even they have subtle differences from just standard historical documents like we would read today and it is patently unfair while well, i'm on my soapbox to try to say that the Bible is a historical document because we're imposing something on it that it never claims for itself, okay? And we're also judging it by standards that we have for that what makes a historical document. It's a theological document, okay? And it's a document that does tell the narrative of things. But, you know, if you read a narrative like A Tale of Two Cities, right? That's something that, that starts at a point it ends at a certain point and then maybe backtracks to deal with some other aspect that needs to be understood. And then another narrative comes in. Another classic example is uh, um, the Brothers Karamazov. You know, that book goes everywhere. It deals with all sorts of different people in all sorts of different contexts. And you don't expect it to be linear. It's not fair to expect it to be linear. Okay. And so the Bible is similar in that regard. Now we know that Abraham is first, then Isaac is second, and Jacob is third. We know there's a linear progression there. Um, but there is a certain little jaunt that happens when Abraham's doing his thing, where we go to Lot and start talking about the adventures of Lot and his wife, who turns into a pillar of salt, poor thing, and the kids and all of that kind of stuff. So you have um, all these different narratives that sort of come in and come out and go around. And so it's just, it's more it's still meant to be understood as something that we should listen to. And it's not fiction. I don't want to call it fiction, but it's a narrative. Okay. It's not a historical document. So it's going to repeat. And then um, another aspect of it is um, there are certain rules within the Old Testament that need to be clearly understood. And to be honest, sometimes they're a little bit modified. So you have them stated. The Ten Commandments are listed twice. Did you know that? Once in Exodus and once in Deuteronomy. And so you have that kind of repetition. It's just, it's just, now I will say once the Torah is over the first five books, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, once those five are, 
are covered. The repetition kind of ends, but it doesn't fully end. Um, you have um, Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, um, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then you have the book of Chronicles. And in Chronicles, you have a repeat of some of the things that happen in the later accounts of First and Second Kings. But that's pretty much it as far as um, that kind of repeating goes. Why? I don't understand how they keep saying um, with the Pharaoh that God hardened his heart. Right. And that's what they keep referring to. Well, yeah. Why did he do that? And okay. Which, which um, that? Yeah, that's a great question because, I mean, if it's if again if it's literal, um, then there's a lot of big questions about predestination and God willing Pharaoh to, to die and all that kind of stuff, or have a demise or have people suffer. Um, I would put it a different way. And now this is my interpretation, and I do this a lot. It's my interpretation. Don't take this as the truth. It's just what I think. And what I think is that um, a lot of times something will happen where someone says yes, and all of a sudden they say no. Okay. Now, if you think about Pharaoh, what Pharaoh is dealing with at this point is a ton of plagues <laughs> that are really wreaking havoc on the stability of the Egyptian kingdom, okay, of his domain. And Moses keeps strolling on up and saying, look, let my people go. If you don't let them go, you're going to get this. If you don't let them go, you're going to get that. You're going to get, you know. And so Moses warns him over and over and over again. Okay. And Pharaoh, after the plague happens and his own magicians can't get rid of it, like the Nile turned to blood, then Pharaoh begs Moses to fix the plague he does fix the plague and the Pharaoh says, I'll let you go. And then what probably happens is advisors come and say, you know, you get rid of those workers. It's going to be a lot harder to make pyramids and it's going to be a lot harder to have any kind. It's forgive me, but it's like the slaves of the South. You know, you get rid of the slaves of the South, you're bankrupting plantations. OK, not that that's a bad thing, mind you. I know what side of the war I was on. But it's it's a a thing that basically his advisors came to him and said, you do that and your country's going to rebel. They're going to tear you up or you're just going to lose everything. And so that, in a sense, is how his heart gets hardened. OK, I mean, I would say it's a much more practical thing that the advisors say this is what's going to happen. And he's like, oh, well, I can't do that. So at the beginning, it said the Lord was going to harden his heart. And what I'm saying is that the whatever happens, and it, that's the way to describe it. From the Hebrew perspective, he says one thing, and then, you know, he knows that he's working against God, okay? Right. Pharaoh even knows he's working against God. Moses knows he's working against God. And so the hardening of the heart is the explanation for why he would be so stupid as to say yes and then say no, Okay. But the reality, I mean, there, I, I, in my opinion, there is a very practical reason for why he said no. But the theological interpretation of that practical reason is that God hardened his heart. OK, he hardened his heart with the crass reality that his country would lose its economic stability. <laughs> that will harden your heart. OK, now, why would I say something like this? Because if you look at the, you know, we're, we're going to eventually get into this in first and second Kings. Interestingly enough, it almost works exactly this way, that when the writer of those books says that the king did what was just in the sight of the Lord, the country doesn't prosper. <laughs> they actually end up starting to fail. But, but because they stand fast with God, they're seen in a positive light. The ones that make treaties with foreign nations, the ones that make allies out of other nations and sacrifice certain aspects of Judaism in order to stay solvent, they're seen as evil in the sight of God, but the nation survives longer under people like that. Okay, now I'm not trying to say anything other than um, 
there are theological interpretations for good rulers that are seen as less than good rulers. And there are theological interpretations for bad rulers where they're seen as good. So it's just it's just one of those things where the interpreter is in the narrator, it's the person writing the story. Okay. So um I would I would, you know, again, we're not predestinarians. We don't believe that um and we are we we don't believe that God turns us into puppets or robots. Okay. So the hardening of the heart, in our opinion, and I realize, you know, okay, well, maybe you're going against scripture here. I, I don't really think so. Because I think it really does have to do with the fact that he would lose his way of life. Think of the Pharisees, okay, in the New Testament. You know, if they didn't know that that was the Messiah, then they're fools. Okay. So don't you think God hardened their hearts too? Because they didn't want the changes that he was going to bring about because they liked their old way of life. So, you know, their hearts were hardened too. They're called stiff necked people, not hardened heart people, but it's the same kind of concept. Good question. One other quick question. Sure, another question. After they mark the houses and stuff to mark the houses. What significance does the 14 days and the seven days there's to eat this bread and eat the unleavened bread and this and that? I mean, it said it should be for generations and generations. Is that Lent? No, Is that it's the Passover thing? Seder. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. It's the Passover Seder. There is a, a feast of Passover that that is about a, a um excuse me, a week long. Okay. And it's actually what was being celebrated at the time of Jesus's crucifixion. Okay. He goes with his disciples to the upper room to eat the Passover meal. All right. And so that meal is meant to be a remembrance of the deliverance of the Hebrew people out of the hands of Pharaoh. And that's why God commands them to celebrate it in that fashion. Okay, the unleavened bread is indicative of, look, you don't have time to wait for the bread to rise. You've got to go. Okay, so everything that's there in that meal is something that could be done rather quickly. I mean, you cook the lamb. That's about the only thing you have to worry about that's going to take time. Everything else can be done fairly quickly. And so matzah is a unleavened bread, and that's what they eat even to this day. And um, the, the bitter and sweet herbs as a reminder of the bitterness of slavery and the sweetness of God's deliverance. Um, you know, so and then, um, yeah, so there are all sorts of different images that come. We do a very similar thing in the service of the Trisagian. That's one of the closest connections I think that we have. It's not the same. It's a very different kind of a service, but we bring boiled wheat, right? And we put in the boiled wheat. Um, it should be a mixture of things sweet and bitter. Sometimes we just say the wheat itself is bitter enough, but you could put dill, that would be fun, in there or something. Greeks put parsley. Greeks put parsley. You could put something in that that is bitter because the bitterness of death, the sweetness of resurrection. OK, not the same thing, but the image is there. OK, of the sweetness and the bitterness. Yeah, so um, that's and and there are many celebrations within the Jewish community. You know, there's um, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. Those two service are feasts are pretty much up against each other. Pentecost was actually their feast before it was our feast. Okay. Different service. All right. A totally different meaning, but it was um, celebrated in Judaism. And then Christianity sort of took it over as 50 days after the uh, resurrection of Christ, when the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples in the upper room. Um, this festival of the booths, um, Hanukkah. Hanukkah itself is a remembrance of um a time when they were under siege and they did not have enough oil to keep all their lamps lit in the temple. And through a miracle, their lamps were lit by God's divine providence. And so you have the candles lit for eight days as a symbol of the light that remained, even though they had run out of oil, God preserved them and kept the light in the temple the whole time. That's Hanukkah. So they're all, I mean, there are all sorts of meaningful celebrations that they have 
um, Passover is probably one. I think Rosh Hashanah is a little bit more important for them. Um, no, excuse me, Yom Kippur is more important for them. But I think, um, but Passover is also extremely important. Um, one more thing to say, Christ is the Passover. Okay, that's why we call our service Pascha. Okay, the Paschal Lamb is the Lamb that is slain for the service of the Passover. Okay, so let's do the theological heavy lifting here. So you put the blood on the lentils to keep the angel of death from entering into your house. Okay, that was the instruction that they were given even before the Passover meal. They were given that instruction. The angel of death will pass over if you're prepared. So they put the blood on the doorway and the angel passes over and, and keeps life with those that are protected under that that doorway okay so christ then becomes our passover okay so by clinging to christ and through his blood all right death passes over and we enter into life right so that imagery of christ being the passover is a very important one and following uh the prophecy of Isaiah, where it talks about the suffering servant and the, the lamb and all of that. Well, like a lamb, he was slain. That image then becomes that Christ is like, that's why we say, well, that in the book of Revelation, where it says, behold, the lamb who was slain. And John, behold, the lamb who was slain in the, uh, in the gospel of St. John. I mean, so we understand him as the true Paschal lamb that saves all from the angel of death, the devil. Okay, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's probably, thank you, good questions. What other questions do we have? I have a question, Father. Sure, Rana. So um, I understand why we would not celebrate Yom Kippur, which is the Day okay. of Atonement, mm -hmm. and why we would not celebrate the Passover now, but are there any of the other um, traditional Jewish holidays or feasts that would be semi-appropriate to still remember knowing that Jesus was Jewish? Um, for that's example, a great question. Like Hanukkah, for example, if that's about uh -huh. a miracle with the lights, I don't know that that's really conflicting to any Christian celebration. So I'm just curious about that. Well, it's not conflicting, but it is competing. It's about the same time as we celebrate Christmas. Um, so I think part of, how do I put this gently? Let me answer your question in a nice way first. Okay. And the nice way is, um, we remember the circumcision of our Lord on January 1st, and we remember the presentation of Christ on the 2nd of February. Both of those practices were routine practices within the Jewish temple worship. Okay. And so those celebrations that were centuries, if not millennia old, practice of circumcision is as old as Abraham, the entrance into the temple, the presentation of Christ at the temple, that is um, as old as, what, the book of Exodus, yeah? So um, you have, um, in, those, um, in those two things, you have us maintaining the traditions that were found in temple practice, okay? So we do have those. Um, but they do also, it's important that they bear the fact that Christ is present in them. The others, unfortunately, um, we live in an interesting time, Rana, where basically we get along with other religions, like Judaism and Islam, for the most part we do. I mean, we certainly we can easily have Muslim friends and Jewish friends, and and that's great. But in the time of St. John Chrysostom and the time before and after that, they were all in competition with each other and rather brutal competition. They hated each other. Okay, so a lot of times you'll hear, oh, well, you know, this service was done to compete. Well, like I just said, the Pentecost service is directly intended to compete with the Pentecost of, um, of the Jewish practice. Um, however, I mean, our scriptures say it happened 50 days after. Um, so it coincides, but we would not do the Jewish version of Pentecost. We do the Christian version of Pentecost. Okay. 
Um, and then, you know, there are people who argue that Christi uh, Christmas itself was set up to compete with the winter solstice of pagan religions and also with uh, Hanukkah. I actually take issue with that. I don't agree at all. And I'll explain why in a second. The reason why I believe is because the 25th of March was a much more important day in the history of Christianity than anything else. Okay. The 25th of March, if you take a look, and I've, I've talked to, to you about this before, but if you look at the book that we use for the Paschal service, when it mentions the day of Pascha, it says it happened on a day that corresponds with the 25th of March. Okay. So that is the ancient tradition that they believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on March 25th. Okay. They also believe. I thought, I thought that's the day he died. No, it's the day he rose. The day he died would be the day you were born. No, because his birth is his resurrection. Okay. Not his yeah. death. And I understood wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, I, I, well, I don't have one of those books here, but if you if you take a look at it, you'll see it corresponds with the 25th of March. Now, our, our our way of keeping track of days is a little weird, so it's really not a whole lot. Well, anyway, 25th of March. So um, the problem with that is we also know it happened on a Sunday, okay? Because they broke the legs on the Lord to prevent the bodies from being on the cross on the Lord on, on the Sabbath day, okay? So there's the Friday when they were crucified and killed all right the two so the two thieves had their legs broken jesus had his side pierced by the spear all that happened on friday saturday was the high day of passover because it's the sabbath day and the sabbath remember in judaism is always saturday okay not sunday it's always saturday okay and then he rises on the first day of the week which is sunday Okay, he rises on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Now, because it's the first day of the week, it's also a Christian understanding that the world itself, day one of creation, is March 25th. Okay, that's a lot harder to prove. Okay, but something else happens on March 25th. What's that? Conception. The conception of our Lord. Right? So we have Annunciation on March 25th. Okay? So March 25th is the beginning of creation, is the, um, the, the conception of Christ or the Annunciation, and the resurrection of Christ. All right? Now, obviously, those things are a little bit different now. We don't know when the world was really created, and so we can say the 25th. That's okay. But what, um, where we get into trouble is that issue of the first day of the week, okay? Because March 25th doesn't stay on a Sunday. It moves around, okay? So March 25th can't be the day that they're going to use. So what the church fathers did is they followed, someone's going to yell at me about this too, probably online, but they followed what the Jewish practice is, the first Saturday, Sunday, after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, Okay. That's how they set the Feast of Passover. Well, we know that Christ had his passion during the Feast of Passover. So we basically say that that's how we're going to do it. We're going to just keep it close to Passover. Now, we don't anymore. There are other things that we've brought into the mix that make things a little bit more complicated. Um, and we have this uncomfortable issue of the new calendar and old calendar and Western Easter and Easter Easter and all of that, right? Um, there are many reasons for that, and I'm not going to get into that in this class. We can talk about that some other time. But it's um, but the so the the, the feast of um, Annunciation is the only thing that remains then on the 25th of March. So that again is the day that's the most important of all of it. So then Christmas is actually just nine months after the feast of Annunciation. So you move from March 25th to December 25th. And that's why you have that day. It has nothing to do with competing with other expressions. And to be honest with you, I think uh, Hanukkah is actually a little newer than Christian uh, than uh, Christmas. I don't think it's the same. Um, 
I don't think they're the same age. I mean, it is during the Maccabean area, which is in the Bible, but the celebration of Hanukkah itself, is, I think, is something that was introduced later in Jewish tradition. It's a way to just kind of keep things, you know, the dreidel and the geld and all that kind of fun stuff. So. All right. A lot of questions we have. Rana, thank you for your question. Did I answer your question? Or do you have any other ones? That did answer my question, but I do have others. Please bring it. Okay. So um, there's a lot of talk in the Old Testament about animals that are clean and not clean. And yes. um, people in certain, you know, bodily fluids being clean and yes. unclean. And right. All sorts of information about what one must do to become clean. Right. And um, I'm just wondering at what point or has because that doesn't really seem to be the tradition nowadays well yes for... and no um well here's a couple of things remember i mean this kind of plays into the same um idea as the god hardening the heart of pharaoh okay one of the greatest things that you don't do if you're jewish or if you're muslim is eat a pig so no ham no bacon Oh, it's terrible. Sure. Terrible. Why did they do that? It's a great question. Do you know what trichinosis is? Yes. Well, what is it? It is a parasite. Um, they weren't that you get from eating well. uncooked so, meat. So people were dying from it. And they said, aha, God has forbidden us from eating that. Because they eat it and they die. So they made a rule to prevent everyone else from dying. And I'm not saying, I mean, maybe Moses was told by God, don't do this. And so they didn't do it. But that's why there was a very visible sign of evidence that they were dying because they were eating that animal. Okay. Animals with a cloven hoof. Um, same thing, just not well prepared. And so people would die and, and, Remember, I mean, these are also migratory people. They're not well established. They don't have, you know, the same understanding of microbiology that we do. They don't have any of that. And I'm not trying to strip away the theological content. I'm just saying, to me, they walk hand in hand with each other. Okay? They walk hand in hand. What's the matter? I said, I think that you still can get sick if well, it's not cooked well. Food safety manager. <laughs> they've actually lowered the in internal temperature of pork actually lower than beef so you it's yeah. not the same as it's know. not the same right well they've, yeah, they've changed their handling they've changed their handling it's it's the same you know back in the day you didn't have to worry about salmonella coming from a chicken egg now you do so you know everything kind of changes over time you know, these different yeah, things true. so um, in that regard, it's it's a, um, I mean, honestly, I think it's because there was visible evidence that people were dying yeah, as a result. True. That's true. Okay. Um, and, it, and it goes into other aspects too. Um, you are not to touch the blood. Um, blood, this is really gross and I'm very sorry, but if you've ever walked past a dumpster where they've thrown out yesterday's ground beef it is well it's not just maggots and all those horrible things but the putridity of it is beyond i mean it will almost immediately bring you to your knees it is so bad and blood spoils almost immediately okay and so you are not to you are not to drink blood you are not to i mean you can cook and the you know but as soon as you cook something the things that look like they're red, it isn't blood anymore. It's some other kind of substance, okay? I mean, unless you're eating a super rare steak, then you're on your own. But you're not supposed to do that. So the so blood, um, the um, other fluids from humans, yeah, I mean, just all that. Yeah, I mean, but, but there's not, I don't know. I mean, by the time you get there, I don't know if there's a lot of blood in Kibbe Nay. There shouldn't be a blood in any... In any no, means, right? Invisible those, yeah, those pink That's things are blood and yeah, the enzymes, the enzymes breaking down. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. There's, I mean, honestly, again, you know, 
you're probably not going to need to eat after this, but you take an animal to the slaughterhouse and they kill it and they suspend it and they let the blood drain out. Okay. So the stuff that is left behind, as Albert just said, it's not blood. It's an enzyme that is breaking things down. And it, it's certainly red, oh, it is but it's red. not It's not that. It it's not the same red. thing. <laughs> Norma's making us all vegetarians. So, um, so there's there's that element to it, and um, the 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 ritual cleanliness. Another aspect is, especially on the part of a priest, I'm even under this obligation now, that when a priest goes and makes an offering, you know, especially one of those priests where they had to dice up a, a cow or something like that and put it on the altar, they risk cutting themselves. And if they cut themselves, then their blood becomes mingled with the blood of the sacrifice. Okay? And that's a no-no. You can't do that. So if a priest cuts himself, even to this day, if I cut myself, I shouldn't be in the altar. I should get out, staunch it, and then get back to my business. But don't be in the altar and bleeding. Funny enough, forgive again. Um, I had to put a parental guidance thing on this one again. Um that's why women are not allowed in the altar. It's not because men are better than women. It's because they have issues with blood that men don't. And so they are not allowed to be there because that is a bloodless sacrifice, a total bloodless sacrifice. When Christ's body is consecrated on the altar, there is no blood anywhere. It is a wine that becomes his blood. It is not blood, like human blood at this point. It becomes Christ's blood, but it is not. So you do not want any mingling. There was to be no mingling in the time of the temple, back when they practiced animal sacrifices. There was to be no mingling now when we do it in the altar at church. Okay, so those kinds of things are all meant to be for specific reasons. The blood that is offered is the blood of the animal, and that is what God is looking for in terms of reconciliation between himself and those that are making the offering. And in Christ's case, he is the sacrifice without blemish. It is through his blood that we are saved, but his blood was shed only once. Okay? Never to be done that way again. And so any physical human blood there is inappropriate in that service. Okay? In those days, we weren't even allowed to go to church. Right. And that's the same in Judaism. See, they actually took that from Judaism. Women couldn't go to synagogue until they had ritually cleansed themselves in a bathhouse that specifically dedicated to the cleansing of a woman. And then they could go. And that's still practiced in the um, Orthodox Judaism. That is still very much a practice. Yep. Not, I don't think it's every week or anything like, or every, not week, is forgive me. Is that practiced in the Islam? I have no idea. I don't think so, but I have no idea. I mean, in their, in their case, they're probably not allowed either. Um, to the mosque on Friday. See, their services on Fridays. Judaism is Saturday. We are Sunday. So um, I honestly, I mean, they, men don't care. I mean, <laughs> to put it um, not so gently, they don't care if women are there or not <laughs> in the mosque. Okay. Um, that's not a concern. But if she is experiencing her period or whatever, um, I don't think she's expected to go. She's not supposed to be there anyway, like I'm saying. So. All right, so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but basically that's the concern is that those things spoil so quickly um, and and get rancid so quickly they can hurt you. Um, we know how quickly, um, you know, there can be a, um, a contamination of some kind of product because of certain fluids or exposure to the air or something like that. And so we just need to be, you know, they needed to be even more vigilant about it. And they had theological rules about it. It's it's for their salvation. I mean, and safety and prolongation of life. That's why they did it. Rana asked about uh, unclean human as well. Well, that's what I'm talking about, the blood, the issue of blood. Okay. Same thing. Does that speak to like um, the lepers and things like that? Um. No, okay. So the question is, does that apply to leprosy and all of that? Not in the same way, but yes. I, I guess you could say so because... Remember what Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priest. Well, that's what you're supposed to do as soon as you're cleansed of any kind of illness. That's a standard for Jewish practice. 
as soon as you are healed, you go and show yourself to the priest. The purpose of being, once you are healed of whatever malady you have, you are expected to go make an offering. So you're showing yourself to the priest is in preparation for whatever animal needed to be sacrificed at the point to give thanks to God for the release of your of your illness. Okay. So yes, I mean, leprosy, um, any of those other kinds of maladies that prevented people from being able to mingle with society. Yep. Yep. And there's the ever popular don't boil a kid in your mother's milk. Okay, which is the reason why to this day there are no cheeseburgers in a Jewish deli. Other questions? Keep them coming. Our Western right people. Okay, our Western right people. Our Western right people. Uh-huh. Have Ash Wednesday. Okay. They have Ash Wednesday. Why? Because they did. Before. What's the symbolism of the cross with the ash? Um, it doesn't have to be a cross. It can be anything. But it's the symbol that you're made of ash. So, but through the cross you're saved. Yeah, today's the, their, their ash Wednesday. Yep. Okay, so um, our... Western Rite celebrates Ash Wednesday, but they don't do it today. At least no, better they not. do it. Well, two days after we start. Right. Okay. Because they right, stick. So. They stick to the same. Okay. So the question is, what kind of typical do they follow? What what's what are the rules that govern how they celebrate? What services they celebrate? Okay. So bear with me for a second, because this is kind of lengthy. All right. So in the Western Rite. It's not just that they look like they're older forms of, of Roman Catholicism or Anglicanism. They are older forms are. of Roman Catholicism and Anglicanism. They've embraced aspects of those services because those services were in existence before the Roman Catholic Church split with us in the East. So these services had already been in existence in places like England and in France and so forth. OK, I don't know to what extent, because I'm not a scholar of that stuff. But what I do know is that these services, these um, Western Rite services have been in existence for centuries. OK, and hand in hand with the Eastern Rite, which is dependent on where you were. It just seems. I can't think of a better way to start Great Lent than Forgiveness Sunday. OK, right. Uh huh. And they don't have it. All right, but what so they have? Like, do they have forgiveness Tuesday? No, but well, I mean, they have Fat Tuesday. They just go well, and eat their, their Tuesday, They just yeah. go and eat their pancakes. They still have Fat Tuesday. Sure. Okay, but yeah. but there's another symbol that is very profound, and that is your dust. Well, that's exactly what the priest says. Okay, you, you are dust, and you always will be dust. Yeah, and and to dust you shall. That's what I say every time I bury somebody. You don't know this, but I do. I say you were taken from dust, and to dust you shall return. Okay, so it is their Lent has a different element to it than ours does. It's that more penitential. We talk about penitence, but we do it in the form of prostrations. They do it in the form of wearing ashes on their forehead. Okay. And, and, you know, the same imagery in their hymnography, I've, I've been to um, Western Rite, or at least read the Western Rite services for, for Lent, and they are very penitential, just like ours are. They are. We went, I went to one, one service mm -hmm. in Orlando. Yep. And uh, obviously, I didn't like it. It, well, and, and and if you came from that into the East, I don't think you'd be comfortable. No, here. either way, I know I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, as as an ortho, you know, as a convert to Orthodox Christianity, um, you know, part of it is what what can I feel comfortable getting rid of? But it it, it was like some of the stuff like what you mean with everything unleavened wafers, right? That seems to just fly in the face of what we believe that that. The the what we want to call it the Last Supper, right? What 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 kind of meal that was? Well, the Last Supper though was with unleavened bread. Okay, so that yeah, it was a Passover so meal. That's, 
That's why they do it. It was a but Passover we look meal. At as a resurrection type thing. Why is that? Why? Mm -hmm. Because that's what we look at. Because Christ is our leaven. Is our leaven. Okay, that's the answer we give. When we use bread that's leavened, it's because Christ is the leavener, okay? In everything, it's not just the yeast of the bread, it's the yeast that's found in wine. Oh, that's true. Okay, so we take the grapes and they're fermented. There's something living that ferments it. We take the, the wheat and it ferments and we have bread. And I read one time that the analogy was that Christ being the yeast of the church. Right. Our leaven. allowed it, created it, and grew it, and, you know. Right. Just like rising. Yes. Bread. So that's I the Eastern. That so that's the Eastern tradition. That's that's what the East looks at and says, this is why we do what we do. So, and in the West, Catholicism, Western Rite Orthodoxy, Anglican. No, not. Uh, I don't know about Anglicanism. Local, the Methodists. The Methodists don't. They cube their bread. No, but they do ashes. Now. Okay, well, but that's I mean that's a different issue. But I mean, if you tear apart their mass, <laughs> and well, I mean structurally, it's not that unlike. You know, you have the liturgy of the Word and you have the liturgy of the Eucharist. Right. If you want to break it down just in two parts. Right. Which the Romans have, we have it. Right. In the West or whatever. Right. The Episcopalians. Yes. I just find it, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I can't get my head around it. Well, trust me. Why do they believe that that's orthodox? Do because it was. the Nicene Creed? Yes, they do the Nicene Creed without the filioque. Without the filioque. Yes. Yeah, without the filioque. No, but, but see, the thing is, for them, that is orthodoxy, because it did exist when orthodoxy was in existence. That's the point. If it did not exist at the time of the schism, it would not be done. But it did exist at the time of the schism. 1054. Oh, well, sure. It was full existence was by that full, time. It was a full what you have to remember about our church. And, you know, it's funny. We get really indignant about Rome and how horrible they were and, and how they, you know, they split from us and blah, blah, blah. Let's be brutally honest. Constantine, when he became the emperor... I don't know if you noticed this, but Rome moved. <laughs> the head of the empire moved from Rome to a place called Constantinople. Byzantium. Which, no, Byzantium is a, a different word. Well, no, that was the name of the city. No, it wasn't. And he named it Constantinople. No, it was a different name. Byzantium actually is a, a um, well, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you that later. It's a Byzantine is a, um, it's a French word meaning old. Um, so, but Constantinople is the city of Constantine. That's what that means. Like Annapolis is the city of Anne. So Constantinople became the, 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 the capital of the Roman Empire thanks to Constantine. All right. Well, what happened to Rome? Bye. Lousy to be you. Good luck. Hang in there. Let me know if we can do it. Oh, no. Don't let us know. And so they were left open to vandals and Visigoths and marauders of all sorts. The city was sacked. The city was left for dead. And so they consolidated. The, the Pope became the local official. That's why now the Pope still is the head of Vatican City. Okay. Vatican City used to be a lot bigger and a lot more powerful than it is now. All right. But that whole thing... Um, happened because Constantine basically pulled all the resources and went eastward, okay, into a very convenient area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea, all right? So, in a sense, it makes sense for them to be unhappy with us, too, because we could have helped them and we didn't, all right? Now, because they were on their own, they started developing their own culture and their own practices, their own theology, their own language. You want to split people up, give them new languages. I yeah. promise you, it'll mess them up. Look at Canada, half French, well, not half, but I mean, you've got the, look at the um, province of Quebec. I mean, no one can get along there because half of them speak French, half of them speak English, and they don't like each other because they don't speak the right language. 
you know, I'm, I'm all for becoming a polyglot. You can learn as many languages as you want, but that's the way to split people up. God knew it. He did it with the Tower of Babel. Let's confuse their tongues and off they go and they don't talk to each other anymore. All right. So you have that situation with, um, with Rome. And so it does make sense that, um, that they're going to start doing things differently. And so they did. And um, you look at St. Gregory, uh, look at the service that we do for pre-sanctified. It's similar to the Orthodox liturgy, but it's not the Orthodox liturgy. Okay. It's different because it comes from Rome very early, but it comes from Rome, Gregory the Great. Okay. And that's, or we call him, what, Gregory the Dialogist. Yeah. Who also wrote a fantastic book on pastoral care, by the way. Um, but that's um, mostly political reasons for those differences to start. And, you know, because they were pretty much on their own, it's hard to travel back and forth. And they only get like 200 years because Rome is really vulnerable or from 400 on. And then by the mid 600s, you've got the Muslims taking over what? Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch. Okay. So you've got 200 years where you could do something productive together. And for the rest of the time, then you're just basically fighting frontier wars with other people. It's not easy. So, what causes these divisions? Lack of communication and lack of understanding. So, I'm a big fan of trying to stay in communication with people you don't agree with it's very important all right other questions coming into the final stretch here johnny do you have any questions no okay good norma how about you do you have any questions nancy rana any questions no more questions here but that was those were great questions folks they were great questions Rana, do you have anything else? Um, I have never heard of Western Rite Orthodoxy. Can you okay. speak a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, Western Rite Orthodoxy is a, a rite that looks more like Catholicism or um, like early Catholicism, like before the um, Vatican II changes happened in the 50s and 60s, um, or older order Anglicanism. Um, it uses hymnody like you would see in a Catholic church, it uses, um, not not that the hymns are the same, but I mean, it's just the structure would be the same. They would have hymns, um, a collect, um, uh, the Gloria Patri, all those kinds of things that you would see in a, um, in a Roman liturgy when they were using Latin as their dominant mm -hmm. language. Okay. Um, it has been in existence sort of in an unofficial capacity for hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years. But it started making a um, a resurgence in America, really as a way, it's an evangelical tool. It's, all, it's, it's also a tool of preference. I mean, I have plenty of friends who are Western writers, as I call them. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure they're going to be very unhappy with me when I um, when they hear what I have to say. But it's um, it really came into the forefront, I would say, in the 40s, 50s and 60s last century. You know, so the 1900s, um, there was a, a, a an Orthodox priest, Father Paul Schnurla, who really developed a love affair with those ancient non-Byzantine style divine liturgies. And so he, um, with the encouragement of Metropolitan Philip, started to do Western Rite liturgies in America. There are two major Western Rite um, representations in America. The Antiochian version still remains good and strong. We have many Western Rite churches here in our diocese. Um, I'm good friends with Father Nicholas Alford, who has a Western Rite Church in Sil uh, is it Silver Spring, Silver Springish, Maryland. Another one is in Thurmont, Maryland. 
Um, let's see, where's the other one? There's one in Lynchburg, Virginia. There's another one just outside of Washington, D.C. in the hills of Virginia. Um, don't know if we have any here in Pennsylvania. I don't think so. Not at least to the Antiochians. Um, and then, I mean, there are, there are uh, Western Rite monasteries in our church. There are a lot of Western Rite churches out in the um, frontier land, some in Colorado. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a going concern in our archdiocese. They have their own, um, they get together and they sort of discuss their concerns and problems. Um, so that's the one. The other is actually through the Russian Orthodox Church or the, what we call the church outside of Russia. And they had um, a Western Rite version also, but that one is not as healthy, I would say. It's kind of, it's an afterthought at this point. And I think they're talking about mergers, but I'm not sure how that's going to transpire. Um, and, you know, like any Orthodox church, they do have disagreements on what can be used in the Orthodox or the, the Western Rite liturgies and what can't. There's one priest who has a particular devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus which I have a real hard time with, but that's his problem, not mine. He can do what he wants. God bless him. Um, so there are, there are tendencies to adopt things that are later developments in Catholicism into the Western Rite. And I'm not sure that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not my business, but if I were in charge, I probably wouldn't do that myself. Um, so it's, um, it's been in existence for quite some time, more than 50 years, more than 60 years, I think, um, in the Antiochian tradition, anyway. And it existed before that, you know, in France and in places like that. They've always had these churches. And one of the keys is just don't say the filioque. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to bring about all that. They have a different calendar than we do. Okay, so they celebrate like St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, I want to say it's like, it's either March 9th or June 9th. I always get it confused. St. Basil, our, our beloved St. Basil, we do it on January 1st. They do it June 14th. Um, they do not have the Feast of the Transfiguration the same way that we do. Other things like that. So, um, And they have services um, that we don't have. And we have services that they don't have. Um, but, you know, we all get together and and we we love one another's brothers. They serve, they can serve Eastern Rite liturgies. Um, I know I I call them by ritual. Um, but they um they they can capably serve. Um, it's a little harder for someone like me to serve in a Western Rite capacity. I've sung in the choir in a Western Rite capacity, but not served with liturgy. And I wouldn't I don't think I would want to. Too complicated for me. Question. Yes, ma'am. Nothing to do with our, our study, but yep. I saw an advertisement for an Antiochian University. It's it's the University of Antioch. It's it's um, it's in Ohio. In Ohio. Yeah, it's not us. It, Antioch is a city, so they just named it. It's a biblical city, so they just named it. You know, America has this lovely penchant to you know you, you go in the hills of Maryland. There's a Mount Tabor. Okay. Um, you know, they just like, you know, there's Beulah Presbyterian Church. There's like all those kinds of things. So they like taking biblical names and it's putting them in America. Mm -hmm. Oh, Antioch's a great name. Yeah. Other questions? Anything? Comments? Concerns? Ron, I suggest you look up on YouTube. Um, there are plenty of um, Western Rite services that you'll see. I don't, I mean, I'll be interested in your opinion. Um, don't expect it to be something you're used to in a in a Eastern right context, it's, it's a little bit different, you know? So just to kind of build on that, I'm, yeah. I know that um, in Butler where I grew up, there's a Byzantine Catholic church. Mm -hmm. Would it be very similar to no, that? They're similar to us. Okay. My friend got married and I was in her wedding at uh -huh. the Byzantine church uh -huh. and it really, really seemed a whole lot like our services. Right. And, that's why I was just kind of curious about that. Yeah, let me tell you a little story about that to wrap up. So um, basically, there are areas in Europe and in the Middle East where one day someone walks in and says, congratulations, you're loyal to the Pope. And then the next day they say, congratulations, you're loyal to the patriarch because of the wars. Okay. 
So they were allowed to keep their same liturgies, but they were required to change the, the, the bishop that they were commemorating. So when you go to a Byzantine Rite Catholic church, mm -hmm. you are actually witnessing a, an Orthodox liturgy where the people are confessing their loyalty to the Pope. Okay. Which is different than the Maronite and Melkite services. Those are different. Maronite is kind of a somewhere halfway between an Orthodox liturgy and a Catholic liturgy. Um, but it's it it's different. But the Byzantine Catholics, because of where they were in the you know in the regions where they were celebrating the Ukraine and places like that, um, one day they would be under people who are loyal to Moscow, and one day they'd be loyal to people who are under the Pope. And so that's and forgive me that it's that, but it is at that day and age that's the way it was. Yeah, so. That's what happens. I mean, you just, you don't change the liturgy. You just change who you're obedient to. And it wasn't like every day, but it did, it happened quite, quite frequently. And that's why we call them uniots. Because they, they have um, orthodox sensibilities, but they're still Catholic. Fun fact, the Carpath, the Russian Orthodox Church was Catholic until 1939. Now they're not. Now they're orthodox but it explains some of their theology, which is more based on Catholic sentiments in certain places. We can elaborate on that some other time. Okay. Well, thank you. That was fun. Um, if you do have any other questions, you can leave them in, um, send me an email or leave them in a comment or something like that. Um, but God bless you. Thanks for joining and God willing, we'll see you next week. Thank you.